Next, we're going to have MIT Technology Review journalist, Will Heaven, um, who is going to be moderating our discussion on invisible AI. Over to you, Will. Hello, thanks so much. Um, yes, we're gonna be having a good chat about invisible AI. Um, we're still waiting for one of our speakers to join, but in the interest of the show going on, um, my first guest and I will start the discussion. Uh, so let me introduce Leslie Nutaboom. He is um, a technology designer uh, with a special interest, as I think we're going to hear, in how AI and humans interact. He co-founded a company called Humanized, Humanizing AI that designs AI systems, putting the human at the center. Um, so I don't want to give a long-winded introduction, but I just wanted to start this discussion with um, by framing it with a question, if, if you like. So the mark of most mature technologies is that it sort of just blends into the background. I think of things like uh, you know, the internet or even the power grid. We expect these things to work, but we don't think about them. Um, you know, we only really notice them when they go wrong. And, and AI is the technology that's maturing faster today. I think you know, most people would agree it's gonna have um, as big an impact as those technologies, power grids and, and internets. But it's different. I don't think we want AI to be a technology that sort of just disappears into the background and isn't thought about. Which um, raises, to my mind at least, then an interesting question about how we interact with this technology. Because uh, we want it to be seamless. We don't want people to have to know how it works and to think about using it all the time. Um, but at the same time, it, it needs to, we need to be aware of it. We need to be aware of its power and the way it might manipulate and the things that might be doing behind the scenes. And even the the, the motivations of the people with these AI systems. I mean, we, a couple of sessions ago, we had Joanna Bryson, who was saying, you know, don't trust companies, don't trust governments, especially when you know, they are the ones with the power. So the question I want to sort of think of in, in this discussion is, you know, how can we have AI as a mature technology that's sort of out of sight in the sense that we don't have to think about it, but certainly not out of mind? Um, and so with that, Leslie, would you sort of introduce a little bit about what, what you do and maybe sort of, you know, in the frame of that, you know, how you think about that, that trade-off in, in your work? Yes, of course. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Leslie, the Chief Product Officer and Co-Founder of Humanizing Autonomy. What we do is we build the global standard for how people and machines interact. And the way that we believe that works well is through a computer vision software that is able to understand and predict human behavior and translate that for a machine to react properly towards. So some of the applications that you can think of are, for example, uh, self-driving cars. How do they understand people? How do they drive around the streets without being a risk to the pedestrians and other road users? That's a complex challenge. And obviously, with the recent advent of deep learning, we were able to train very exciting models to understand how these people are currently acting and how they might want to act in the future. But there's a, a very big caveat, which is trust. We figured right in the beginning when we started the whole company that people didn't trust self-driving cars. They couldn't look into the eyes of the driver. There wasn't any indication of how this vehicle is making its decisions and even how this vehicle understands the world around it. And that's where the whole invisible AI actually becomes a really interesting topic to discuss because how do you make it invisible to the people around the AI? So um, obviously there's different ways. You can visualize how it's thinking, you can understand to people through the media how it's making these kind of decisions, but oftentimes that's not enough. And even for functional safety requirements of these systems, which the automotive sector has loads of, that wasn't enough either. So the first conversations that we were having with customers was, how do we know that we can trust your system? You're saying it's a deep learning model, that's just a black box where you have no idea how it's making its decisions. So how do you explain why it would have to break or why it would have to swerve? And how could we sell this to the regulators in our industry to make them believe that we would make the right decisions? So I think there's three main uh, important topics to discuss around invis invisible AI. So the first is to make it interpretable, meaning you have to understand how it's making its decisions. The second is visualizing, which is showing how it's making its decisions, but also making people aware that it is AI and not a human decision that's being made. And the third is the involvement of community. So things like citizens, juries, making sure that the relevant stakeholders are aware of the use of AI and 
have influence in how it's making the, its decisions later down the line. So that's kind of the the, the spiel <laughs> that I wanted to throw out here in the, our discussion, and I, I think we can have a great discussion around it. Yeah, I know. I think it's great. I, I love how you sort of boiled it down to those three topics, and I'd love to go 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 through those. But I mean, am I right in thinking that you know, you'd agree that it's sort of ultimately it all boils down to trust? This is a technology that has enormous potential, but we're going to we're not going to see that potential, certainly not sort of in mainstream uses, if we don't get that trust. We don't give that trust to to, to people, um, and I think all of those things sort of uh, you know address trust in in, in different ways. But let, let's dive in you know, with the sort of the, the details to begin with. Like, talk to me about the sort of the I suppose the technical side of, of what you do. You mentioned um, interpretability. Inter <laughs> I'm already messing up the big word. Interpretability. Um, everyone say that quickly. Um, and that's often sort of linked with this other notion of explainability. Um, you know, both are aimed at trying to sort of understand what's inside the black box. You know, these vast um, deep neural networks uh, make decisions, whether it's you know recognizing an image or um, you know or deciding what sort of Netflix show we're going to make next, pulling together enormous numbers of correlations. And you can't actually go even you know it's not that people aren't experts. You can't actually go in and open the system and say you know, how do you reach that decision? It's just too complicated. Um, so talk to me about that. What's the difference between interpretability and explainability? So explainability is kind of going back into the past. So you've trained a model just on a, a whole lot of data and it's decided what to weight its decisions on to come to a final decision of what it can see, for example. Interpretability actually explains to you how it came to that decision. And the way that you can do that is to modularize the, the higher level decision into smaller components underneath it. So let's take, for example, predicting where a person is going to move towards. You could take a model. Uh, you, you take 100,000 videos where you say, this is where the person started, and that's where the person ended. And you make, make up your mind as to why you think that person got there. Give me a model, construct yourself, and when you then test it on some test data, it will tell you where the person is going to go. Fine. That might work, but you have no idea what it's basing its decisions on. What you could also do is build smaller models that you can then use probabilistic networks for to come to that higher level decision. So for example, is it a person? Or is it someone on an e-scooter? Is it someone on a bicycle? Does the person look at the road? Does the person wait on the side of the sidewalk? Is the person on their phone? Those are all modular. Uh, components of human behavior that you can then combine to come to your higher level understanding of whether someone is going to cross the road. And mm -hmm. so, just in breaking it down like that into sort of you know components of a decision, that's important because then you can sort of go in and say you know at which point parts of the decision were were made. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you 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 make it much less abstract because you it allows you to look at certain features of that model and tell you. Hey, wait a second. I had no idea uh, that this person was um, doing a moonwalk backwards over the road. This is why I didn't understand it. And it also provides you an uncertainty value, which is the benefit of that probabilistic approach, because it basically tells you I was looking at these models. I was able to understand a pattern of behavior from those models, but there was something that was a bit off. And I didn't fully understand why I was doing it. So I'm going to assign a lower uh, or a higher uncertainty value to my prediction of what that behavior is going to be. So this is exactly how, uh, for example, you, you have to do uh, testing of vehicles at the moment. When it fails, you have to be able to explain this component broke, uh, that cable burnt through, all those different tests to be able to make a car roadworthy are essential to be tested. And if you cannot do that with the perception of the world of that car, then how are you ever going to have a car drive around so, uh, autonomously? Gotcha. So that's a problem in fully autonomous, but even in advanced driver assistance systems, when you decide to alert a car or automatically do an emergency brake, or even when you just use dash cam, so you want to send an alert to a driver, like a sound, to tell them to watch out. Because you don't want these users of your product to be endlessly annoyed with an overload of, of alerts. Uh, and you have to be able to explain why is it alerting, so you can then prevent it 
So you find edge cases that you can then retrain models on, maybe add a new module that is for a different use that you hadn't expected your product to be used for, so that you can then prevent that in the future. Okay, Let, let's let, let's come back to that in a minute because I think that's um, uh, you know, you're touching there on sort of visibility, how you sort of you know, make the the working of the AI system you know visible to the person using it, you know, the the passenger in the car or, or what have you. But before we move on to that, um, I'm interested when you talk about the sort of making um, you know, deep learning systems more modular. Does that fundamentally change the the technology? I mean. Uh, we're seeing now some of the biggest, most successful AI models. I mean, thinking of like large language models like GPT-3, their power comes from their size being, you know, one vast network that pulls in loads of data and, and you know, does weird and wonderful things with it. Um, are you suggesting that sort of we need to move away from that paradigm and, and make AI more understandable by changing how the sort of neural networks are composed? I think they're great benchmarks to see where you can arrive with that approach. And one of the risks that you have with interpretable AI is that you need expert knowledge. So basically, you need expert knowledge to understand how language is being formed, for example, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in natural language uh, models, um, which, which can be challenging, right? And sometimes we have the wrong assumptions, which is why these models can outperform expert knowledge-based uh, models. Mm -hmm. So I think it is. It is kind of a game where you've got the expert knowledge trying to compete with the, the computer-generated understanding of a certain problem. Um, but I believe that if you want to fully trust a technology like one of those, you need to understand what it's based, basing its decisions on. Now, there is, a, there is a bit of a caveat with interpretability. So uh, when you look at those layers that I explained, where you've got higher level behavior of humans, for example, one underneath there is the, the smaller behaviors or the, the simpler um, movements that people are making. And then one underneath that is a more foundational layer, which is, is this a person or not? Mm -hmm. That lower foundational model, whether someone is a person or not, that's much more difficult to make interpretable. So usually what you can only do is to make those explainable. So you can look at the layers within the neural network, why those layers are determining whether someone is a person in the end by visualizing what pixels it's looking at or what, what colors it's looking at. And that's a way in which you kind of go back into your model and try to understand how it decided that this was a person. And hopefully through generative adversarial networks mm -hmm. also create edge cases. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like you take the model and you let the model show you what it would generate if it would be allowed to create an image that itself would think is a perfect example of what you're asking it to do for you. And if you then see in, for example, um, I'm trying to come up with an example for natural language processing, but it's just, it's really slipping my mind. But if you look at it for, from, a, from a human behavior perspective, which I have to deal with every day, so it's a little bit easier to come up with an example. If it shows you that it's, it, the general adversarial networks always make people with red coats, then you know that probably your data set is overrepresentative of people with red coats. And it won't perform as well with people who are wearing yellow coats. So that gives you kind of a, a hint towards how you could improve your model even before it's out into the wild. Okay, thank you. Uh, I like the example. Um, you know, thinking, you know, as a, as a product designer, um, this these things you're talking about, are they things that you uh, you care about at the design stage, at the test stage? Or are you saying these are things that should be designed into the system and are there just to help a human interact with it you know, through the lifetime of that product, whether it's a driverless car or, or what have you? Yeah, I think maybe I, sh I should add a fourth one uh, to, the, to the three points that I had in the beginning, which is that you need to learn continuously. The world is an ever-changing environment, right? People change their behavior, people look differently. There's maybe a new fashion style in the next year that makes people wear reflective coats. Your model will not have any idea how to deal with those new behaviors or those new looks of people. So what you cannot do is you cannot design a, a, a model, ship it, and forget it, which is basically how we used to describe the automotive industry in the past, ship and forget. You sold a car, and that was it. You made your money. That's the end of it. But if you create a, a model that has to respond to people's behavior and is very risky 
to deploy in real world environments, you cannot just leave it there and believe that it's going to do its thing for the next 50 years. You need to build a system that's able to learn and continuously learn from new ways that people interact with it, mm -hmm. uh, new ways in which it might make the wrong decisions. So you have to keep a constant connection between what you've shipped and, uh, and how that performs. Okay. So I understand um, how you know an engineer designing these things might you know, interact with with a, a system while it's learning, sort of to understand how it works. But you're also talking about your know, visibility during use. I mean, how would you know someone who you know, knows nothing about the workings of AI and doesn't want to, you know, nor should we expect them to know about the AI in their car? How do, as a product designer, how do you think about that, making sort of the AI? visible and the driver aware of why their car is doing certain things, but, you know, without making it, I mean, it's an interface, user interface problem, I guess. Yeah, yeah, correct. I think one, one really good example of it is, um, is, for example, GDPR and the way that the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK has deployed it here. So, first of all, uh, th this is more about privacy rather than the ethical use of AI or the invisibility of AI, but basically informing people that they are being filmed is the first, right? Uh, making, making sure that uh, people know where to complain when they have been filmed in a location where they didn't want to be filmed. That's an interface that you're creating between people that are affected by your AI or by your uh, camera system and giving them an opportunity to respond to it. So I think that's an essential part of the, um, the, the visibility of AI, where even when people might not care that much about how the technology has been developed, but if they feel they've been wrongly affected by the technology in their lives, that they have someone or something that they could voice their concerns towards and hopefully take that into account through legal frameworks, through um, one, one really nice example that I like that we deploy when, when we're developing new technologies is citizens' juries, where you basically take a sample of the people that are going to be affected by your technology and have a conversation with them, see how they react to when an uh, AI model would make a certain decision. Even if it, that AI model doesn't exist yet, you can just tell them, so what would you feel like if a vehicle would drive very aggressively when it knows that you're breaking the law. How would you react to that vehicle? Would you feel comfortable if that vehicle wasn't able to understand that you're in a wheelchair rather than on a bicycle? So I think there's a whole load of social challenges with developing a technology like ours, like any AI model, really, that's that's being used. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that yeah. voice as well? Uh, I did. I wasn't sure what it is. Um, okay. <laughs> we're, we're still going. In, um, invisible alerts. Yeah. Um, I'm, I just I was going to tell the audience that unfortunately um, Barbara Fusinka still uh, we haven't been able to to reach her. So um, Leslie, let me let's just ask you one final question um, and then and then we'll wrap up. I think you're already getting to your so your third level of visibility that you so nicely began with when you're talking about you know, at the community level. Um, and I'm interested in, you know, to what extent these problems have technical fix fixes versus, um, you know, societal level fixes or, or, or regulatory fixes. I mean, how do those all come together? I mean, that's a vast question, but, you know, in, in, in your experience, what's the best way to, to approach that? Um, like a citizen's jury exponentially grown, where not only do you take into account the, the people that are going to interact with your technology, but also involving governments, involving regulatory organizations, um, involving ethics groups. Um, I think there's, there's, you cannot develop a technology, an exponential technology in a silo, because it grows so, so fast and so quickly that you need to take so many things into account before you just throw it out there and let it wreak havoc. Uh, in a way that you have never expected. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's something that's really important where um, we hope we're doing a good job. Uh, and I believe that most of the large organizations that deploy AI are currently trying to figure out a way how to do that properly through ethics committees, um, through much deeper conversations with organizations like, for example, the European Commission's uh, AI, AI Alliance, AI Alliance, um, World Economic Forum, United Nations, all 
hosting these conversations between all the different organizations and, and governmental uh, layers and people developing te the technology, that I do hope that there's more of a social aspect to uh, these kind of products than, than uh, it has been. Yes, yeah. no, like, like, likewise. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to ask you for a timeline for, for driverless cars. I mean, we've sort of been there and that moment has, has passed. I mean, they're you know, already here in the sense they're being tested on the road. But um, just final brief point. It, is it fair to say that, you know, it's not really the, um, for want of a you know, technical solution? You know, these cars do work. Is it a question of trust? We need to make cars that not only work, but people trust. Uh, for sure. And I think that even the companies who have the vehicles out at the moment aren't fully convinced that they are safe enough to put into the wild everywhere. So um, it's, it's nice to have seen the development from pure highway driving in uh, Silicon Valley to more city driving, such as Phoenix, and now more um, urban, like much more urban environments in San Francisco. But I have yet to see a car drive through Mumbai. Uh, I have yet to see more than five autonomous cars drive through London for longer than a couple hours. So uh, I think that's, that's a big challenge. And that's something that we've had to learn the hard way as well. Uh, we've had to realize that it's, it's actually still quite far out to have these um, fully autonomous systems. So we've had to scale down our uh, technology to work on far smaller chips so that they can be used now in the real world through earlier technologies like, for example, dash cams or robots that drive through factories where you're posing much less of a risk to society, but you can already provide value, obviously, to your customers and test how society reacts to those smaller scale, less risky deployments of these AI systems. So I think that's another way that might be helpful to deploy these kinds of uh, invisible AIs mm -hmm. is to experiment in less risky ways in the real world rather than keeping it in simulation worlds in, uh, on your computer, because that isn't really how the real world will react to it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, it's, everyone has noticed that we have Barbara with us. Barbara Fisinka, thank you for joining Sorry, I no, really no thought the session starts like not, in 20 minutes. I don't know how I missed that. It's just nice to see that you've gone from invisible to visible. Um, so, Barbara is, uh, has a wealth of experience in, um, in, in building industrial AI systems at, you know, at Microsoft, at Google, and now at, at Twitter. Um, so Leslie and I have been talking quite a bit about his work um, sort of making AI systems with a particular focus for him and his company in driverless cars, you know, how you have a system that sort of just works behind the scenes, but is also one that people trust because um, you know, its decision making is made visible both at the design and testing stage and, you know, continuously through its, its lifetime for, for the users. Um, but I know that, you know, you've done a little bit of work with um, autonomous vehicles, but also a whole host of other things. So I wonder if you could just give, a, you know, a couple of highlights of projects that you've worked on where you've had to think about um, this trade-off that we started with, with AI that works and is invisible in the background, but also AI that is um, visible enough that we can question it and we don't have to sort of, you know, trust it blindly. Yes, of course. Uh, I can think of two projects at the moment. So one was with autonomous ve vehicles and uh, the premise of the project, the motivation for the project was uh, convenience. So why do we have to uh, involve people if we can have um, technology to make decisions so it's much more reliable and not based on stuff that are less understandable like instinct or like experience why cannot we just have technology to sort it out mm -hmm. so you could think of uh, sensors uh, like obviously video is one of the sensors but stuff like radar or lidar uh, so we were working with a company that was uh, trying to uh, basically see the obstacles and run those vehicles uh, seamlessly or like with minimal crew on board. And um, like that was a premise, that was the, the primal motivation. And uh, it went very well in terms of those uh, assumptions that we had. Uh, however, because those vehicles were um, in a place where there were like border stuff, uh, there were other vehicles run by other people 
Um, so it was, um, those vehicles were on water. So those were like boats or ships. Um, there were other considerations rather than just omitting obstacles or just moving from point A to B. And um, without like, for example, putting some logic in it without human intervention, it would be very hard to, to make it seamless, to make it just AI. Mm -hmm. So that was like one project when, uh, that comes to my mind. Another project was um, a company that wanted to use sensor data to help uh, with uh, finding out and helping um, elderly people, for example. So basically recognizing if the person needs help, if the person collapsed, do they need help? And they uh, maybe would not replace a caretaker, but um, in, in the moments when, uh, when a person that might, might need help, they are alone, it could support the other people that could take care of them. Mm -hmm. And you could very clearly see in both those cases that there are some like AI ethics stuff coming into place. For example, with vehicles, not just the boat ones, but any vehicles, um, whenever there is an accident and there was a situation like this, like who takes the blame? Who can we sue? Who can we say, actually, some someone or something screwed up and who takes responsibility? And it's not about just legal stuff. It's more about thinking about the future. Yeah. Uh, with sensor data, um, like we had this concern when I was working on this project. Uh, what if somebody wants to weaponize it? What if somebody wants to use those sensors to use it in the battlefield and see if enemy is down? So like straight away from great motivation, people are uh, like thinking, yes, yes, we want to make this world a better place and use technology to it. Uh, you can you can straight away think of some scenarios that are not necessarily taken from the movies uh, yeah. that those those things can be weaponized. Yeah, I mean it's not new that you know technology has you know, what, what's often called dual use. You can have a good use and a and, and a bad use, but I think that's particularly the case with with AI, where I think there's a general perception that um, I mean, not that AI itself works mysteriously, but there's some mystery around you know who's doing what with AI. I um, mean because it's potential. For, for misuse is is large um and so i just want to end the session with um just a general question about you know the future of of, of ai as you say you know, visibility seems to be crucial in the sense that um you know the, the everyone needs to understand it a bit better trust it a bit better but without you know sort of knowing the nuts and bolts of of how it works and i mean so barbara i mean do you have a a sort of a big big picture sort of vision about how we get to that point where we we get more visibility and more trust, whatever the AI is being used for. So this is a very, very difficult question. There are like committees and like nationwide being put together with people trying to raise awareness, trying to think how we could uh, make it safer. Um, I was always thinking of it in terms of if you ask for an opinion of an expert on a field, why do you trust them? Mm -hmm. Why do you, uh, what, what is the reason that you trust them? Uh, you may look at their credentials, you may look at their experience, and uh, this makes you feel safer. But at some point, there is this belief, there is this faith thing, and it's going a little contradictory to what we're like saying usually with science and, and faith that they, they really are not. At some point, you have to trust somebody or something. Mm -hmm. And I think our thinking now is moving towards uh, we either choose to trust or we either choose not to trust. And with plenty of things uh, changing so quickly recently, like with social media, where our privacy concerns has been smashed mm -hmm. completely, right? We're like, at some point, we're just saying, fine. I just prefer to have the contact with my social network. I don't care how many ads I get. Like, I don't care how much they know me. It is scary, but like, I'm fine with it. And we, we do it consciously very often. And mm -hmm. it's probably also happening like better with new generations. Um, like when, when those concerns are not even ra risen. So, uh, so people are just 
born to this world and this is how yeah. it is for them. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking will happen. Some, something like this will happen with trusting AI. Yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I think you're, you're spot on there. I think it's, you know, AI you know, isn't there yet. There's lots of things we need to change about it, but I think people, I think, you know, in making those choices, you know, society itself will change. And we're, we're at that point now where sort of everything's up for grabs. Um, and it's great that we're having discussions like this to help inform, you know, our choices about what kind of future that will be. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, Barbara. I'm delighted that we got to chat to you a bit at the end. Um, and Leslie, thank you so much for, for our conversation that kicked this off. Um, and thanks everyone for, for joining us.